Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about arterial blood gas and how to interpret the acid base imbalance. My goal in the next few lectures would be to understand the steps for interpreting an arterial blood gas, understanding the clinical application in diagnosing underlying condition, and understand how to use it in clinical context of your patients. And in the end, we'll go through some basic principles so that you can minimize getting ABG and interpret other data around you to get to the similar conclusions. ABG is useful in many situations and are usually ordered when your patients are very sick. So you would want to interpret them thoroughly and get comfortable with the nuances. A lot of videos out there talk about very basic concepts. In this lecture, we'll go into more details. ABG gives information about oxygenation, ventilation and acid-based disturbances. Always interpret ABG in clinical context and you will get better at it only if you practice it. While understanding the henderson hasselbeck equation is important for deeper understanding of ABG, it's not prerequisite for this lecture. We'll talk about more details in the subsequent ones. So there are four steps in reading ABG. First, identify the clinical context, then identify the acid-base problem, and then try to figure out if that acid-base problem is clinically significant or relevant. And finally, find out what's really causing that acid-base problem in your patient. So you have to perform all these four steps when looking at the acid-base disorders from an ABG. In reading ABG, we do not use normal ranges. We just use one value. So a normal ABG has pH of 10.4, pacu 2 of 40, bicarb of 24, and an anion gap of 12. And an anion gap can be adjusted for the level of albumin. The five steps to reading any ABG is step one, check your pH and you have to figure out if it is acidemia or alkalemia. Step two, look at your pHCO2, not the bicarb. This step tells you the predominant process, whether it is respiratory or metabolic. Next, check for the degree of compensation and this tells you if the predominant process is being adequately compensated. Then calculate the anion gap and finally calculate the bicarb or delta gap. And this will tell you if there are other hidden processes besides an ion gap. And you have to go this in order. You cannot do step three first and then look at step one. You have to go through all these five steps in this order and this order alone. Step one, check your pH. As you talked about, any pH less than 7.4 is acidosis. That means pH of 7.39 is acidosis. Any pH more than 7.4 is alkalosis. So pH of 7.41 is not normal, it's alkalosis. Step two, look at the pCO2. And this gives you the largest or primary component of the underlying process. Do not look at the bicarb at this step. If the pH from step one is acidosis and your pCO2 is more than 40, that means the predominant process is respiratory. So take a moment to understand this. Carbon dioxide is acidic. So the pH is acidic and carbon dioxide levels are high, that means that process is from elevated CO2, that means respiratory acidosis. If your pCO2 is less than 40, that means predominant process is metabolic. If your pH is acidic and carbon dioxide is low, that is carbon dioxide is not the reason for acidosis, it is the metabolic reasons that are causing the acidosis. Similarly, if your pH from step one is alkalosis, your pCO2 is less than 40, that means the predominant process is respiratory and pCO2 is more than 40, that means predominant process is metabolic. Next step, calculate compensation and there are two ways for compensation, respiratory and metabolic. If primary process is metabolic, body will compensate by respiratory means and if the primary process is respiratory, the body will compensate with metabolic means. If the primary process is acidosis, the body will compensate by alkalosis and vice versa. You can never overcompensate. That means if you developed acidosis and your body is trying to compensate with alkalosis, the pH will never go above 7.4. And if you developed alkalosis and your body is compensating with acidosis, the pH will never fall below 7.4. So let's look at a few compensation. Most important compensation is the respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. 
So if we have metabolic acidosis, this is going to stimulate the minute ventilation and you are going to lose carbon dioxide. That means you are losing acid and making your blood more alkaline. And this is the famous winter formula that everybody knows about. Your expected PCO2 should be 1.5 times bicarb plus 8 plus minus 2. If you don't remember this formula, understand that in a well compensated metabolic acidosis, pCO2 should reach the last two digit of the pH. For example, in this case, pH is 7.25, bicarb is 11, pCO2 is 30. So expected pCO2 by Winters formula is 24. Or if you look at the last two digit of 7.25, it's around 25. So here the measure pCO2 is 30, while your expected is 24. If your lungs were working perfectly, you should have reached the pCO2 of 24. But in this case, you are not reaching 24, you are at 30. So that means you are retaining six more carbon dioxide than a normal response. So you are unable to compensate adequately. So there is an additional respiratory acidosis on top of this metabolic acidosis. If your pCO2 was 18 in this circumstance, that means you are blowing out six more CO2 than a normal response. So you have additional respiratory alkalosis. So compare the expected pCO2 from the patient's pCO2 to figure out if there is any uncompensated respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. Respiratory compensation for metabolic alkalosis works similarly. If you are alkalotic, you will have decreased minute ventilation, accumulation of CO2, so making your blood a little bit more acidic and trying to compensate for metabolic alkalosis. Elevation of 6 of bicarb increases your pCO2 by about 10. So for example, if your pH was 7.5, bicarb 36 and pCO2 of 52, your bicarb has risen to 36 from 24, that means change of 12 points. And you know that 6 bicarb will increase pCO2 by 10. So 12 should increase it by 20. So your expected pCO2 would be 40 plus 20, that is 60. However, in this case, your pCO2 is only 52. So you are blowing out 8 more pCO2 than a normal response. So you have additional respiratory alkalosis on, on top of the primary metabolic alkalosis. Similarly, if your pCO2 was 72, that means you are retaining 12 more CO2 than a normal response. So you have an additional respiratory acidosis on top of the metabolic alkalosis. Important th thing to note in compensation for metabolic alkalosis is respiratory compensation is not very accurate. So interpret it with quite a caution. If you have respiratory acidosis, the reaction of carbon dioxide toward the bicarb is shifted towards right, making formation of more bicarb. So increasing your bicarb levels and making it a little bit more alkaline. There is a slight stimulation for kidneys to make more bicarb as well. So in acute condition, 10 millimeter rise of pCO2 will increase your bicarb by one. So for example, if your pCO2 is 80, acutely your bicarb should be 24 plus four, that is 28. In chronic condition, most of the bicarb that will be produced by the renal compensation and here 10 millimeter of pCO2 will increase bicarb by six. If you have respiratory alkalosis, you will shift this reaction towards the left. So making more CO2 and losing bicarb it means you are becoming more acidic. It will also inhibit production of bicarb by the kidneys. So acutely 10 millimeter fall in pCO2 will drop bicarb by two. So for example, if your pCO2 was 20, your bicarb should be 24 minus two times two, that is 20. In respiratory alkalosis, your kidneys will try to lose as much bicarb as possible. So every 10 millimeter fall in pCO2 will drop your bicarb by six. Next, calculate the anion gap. Anion gap is sodium minus sum of chloride and bicarb. Normal anion gap is around 12. Do not get the bicarb value from the EBG machine as this is a calculated bicarb. You want to get the bicarb value from the basic chemistry, which measures total bicarb. That means real bicarb and dissolved CO2. And you should be using this in your calculations. Always correct for the albumin. And we know that the correction factor for albumin is drop in anion gap by 2.5 per one gram per dl fall in albumin levels. Remember Goldmark acronym for figuring out where anion gap is coming from. And you can review my lecture on anion gap to understand more. Finally, the bicarb or delta gap. So let's try to understand where this comes from. 
if we add a lactic acid ion to the pool, it is going to break into lactate and hydrogen ion. This hydrogen ion is going to combine with bicarb to form CO2 and water and carbon dioxide is going to be breathed out while the lactic acid is going to remain in the serum and increase your anion gap. So if you add one lactate to the pool, you will use one bicarb and your anion gap will rise by one. So there is one to one to one relationship. That means if you add one milliequivalent of acid, you will use one milliequivalent of bicarb and your anion gap will increase by one. If you have higher amount of lactic acid, say for example 10, you will use 10 bicarb and your anion gap will increase by 10. Normal values of bicarb is 24 and anion gap is 12. If you add one lactic acid to the pool, your anion gap increases to 13 and bicarb falls to 23. If you add two, anion gap increases to 14 and bicarb falls to 22 and so on and so forth. So let's look at this blood gas where pH is 7.1, bicarb is 9. Your anion gap in this condition is 20. So that means your bicarb level for this level of anion gap should be 16. However, when you look at this, your actual bicarb is 11. One of the things we'll note that we are not using the bicarb from the ABZ, we are using the bicarb from the basic chemistry. So this patient lost additional 5 bicarb from some other process, which is not from an ion gap. Since he lost additional bicarb ion, there's another metabolic acidosis going on as well. Since this is not from an ion gap, this is a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis along with the anion gap acidosis that's occurring here. Let's take another example. Here your pH is 7.28 and bicarb is 20, your anion gap is 23. So for this level of anion gap from 12 to 23, your bicarb should have fallen from 24 to 13, but the actual bicarb is 20. So this patient has gained seven bicarb from some other process. And since he's gaining bicarb, there's a metabolic alkalosis process going on. So he also has additional metabolic alkalosis on top of anion gap metabolic acidosis. So let's look at a few examples. Step one was looking at pH. Here this pH is 7.25, which is less than 7.4. So this is acidosis. PCO2 is 35. That means this process is metabolic. Since if it was respiratory, the PCO2 should be higher than 40. You compensate for metabolic acidosis using Winter's formula. Expected PCO2 should be around 30, but the PCO2 is 35. So he's retaining five more carbon dioxide molecules than expected. So he also has a respiratory acidosis going on. His anion gap is 18. So he has an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And then we calculate your bicarb gap or delta gap. At the anion gap of 18, your bicarb should be 18 as well but this patient measured bicarb is only 15. So he lost another three bicarb somewhere else. Since losing bicarb is acidosis, he also has a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So this patient has anion gap metabolic acidosis, non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, and respiratory acidosis. Let's look at another ABZ, and it's a tricky one. Your pH is 7.4, bicarb is 24, and pCO2 is 40. So like all the ABCs, you got to do all five steps every time to get this thing right. So pH is 7.4, which is neutral. PCO2 is 40, that's normal. There's no compensation because the pH is normal. Your anion gap, however, is 20. So this patient has an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And for the anion gap of 20, his bicarb should be 16. However, his measured bicarb is 24. So he has gained eight bicarb from somewhere else. So he also has a hidden metabolic alkalosis. So this patient, even the AVG looks pretty normal. He has anion gap metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. And in this patient, this metabolic acidosis and alkalosis have balanced really well to give almost a normal looking ABG. This is a scenario, for example, in patient with DKA and excessive vomiting, they can present as such as your DKA causes anion gap acidosis and vomiting cause metabolic alkalosis. So five steps to reading in ABZ. The most important thing is always interpret ABZ with clinical context and we'll talk about that in our next lecture. Step one, check your pH. Step two, look at your PaCO2. Do not look at bicarb. Check the degree of compensation, calculate an end gap and then calculate your bicarb gap. And you remember you have to go it in this order.
Next step is certainly use your clinical judgment if the acid-base issues in your patient are clinically relevant. This is where you can look at the range and say that the things still look normal and you have to do nothing. Step three is the finding out the underlying cause of the acid-base problem. Knowing whether the process is metabolic or respiratory does not really mean anything unless you have a clinical diagnosis associated with these. The last step is the most important. It is looking at the ABG with clinical context because patients with chronic component, for example, COPD with CO2 retainers or patients on layer 6 or other chronic kidney diseases can have abnormal bicarb and CO2 levels with a normal pH at baseline. And you have to understand how these changes will affect your change in your ABG interpretation. We'll talk about this in more details in the next lecture. Thank you.